<laughs> so I agree with you. All right, so I agree with you. We, we, say, we see definitely a, a change in behavior in Arnie, the main character in Stephen King's Christine, uh, that is a change from previous functioning. And, and that's directly from the DSM, change from previous functioning. When we see this, especially on a written test, um, we, ha we have to all of a sudden think that there might be something going on with regard to a mental disorder, right? Change from previous function, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, conversely, the opposite is also true. That is, when a patient presents with um, uh, abnormal behavior, and certainly even abnormal behavior that is clinically significant, then maybe a mental disorder is not what's going on, but a personality disorder. And here I'm just kind of you know, splitting hairs because um, in, in a larger context, uh, personality disorders are an example of a mental disorder, but there's your differentiation. So Arnie's is a change from previous functioning. Now, you um, specifically identified that his personality changed. Right. And in as much as his personality changed, it's interesting because you identify that domain and behavior called personality. But I just mentioned that personality disorders are defined through, uh, or defined as something that doesn't change from a previous baseline. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have to come to grips with this, right? Because right? Uh, that doesn't make sense, right? Your personality doesn't change. You are who you are for, for the most part uh, by the time you're a late adolescent or early adult, for better or for worse. That is, our personality characteristics tend to be crystallized um, during that time. And if they can crystallize in a maladaptive formation, guess what? You're at risk for developing a personality disorder. Most of us, thankfully, get crystallized uh, in, a in, a, in, a, in a more adaptive formation and therefore sidestep being diagnosed with a personality disorder. Um, this is an abrupt change. This is a change from previous functioning. So yes, I think his personality changes, but I think it is not due to a personality disorder. Yeah, right? I would agree a, with you. It's a clever, yeah. it's a clever way that Stephen King's introducing this. Now, you did name a disorder. You said uh, you you came to uh, I would say the conclusion, but certainly a provisional diagnosis of mo multiple personality disorder, currently known as dissociative identity disorder or DID, right? Um, before we even get to what that is. Right, we don't, we're gonna have to define it, but even before we get to its definition, what must we first investigate before we would actually begin to focus on or hone in on uh, a mental disorder in general, uh, for example, DID? So I'd say there are two things, there's two layers of it. Um, like any other psychiatric illness, first we have to rule out that his current change in functioning is not due to an underlying medical condition. Uh, and as well as a um, use of a substance that causes behavior. And then secondly, that's, that, that part is true for any psychiatric illness. I'd say we also have to make sure that there's no other kind of acute um, or any other, I feel like the idea would be a, a diagnosis of exclusion. And we'd have to make sure just, you know, a lot of the other common psychiatric illnesses, things like psychosis, mood disorders, a variety of other psychopathologies, um, we'd have to first rule out those disorders before considering something like DID, which is hard to prove. Hard to, and and, and um, with, with a significantly lower incidence. Correct. Right? Yeah. So uh, that is true. Uh, the first step has to be to investigate what is often referred to as an organic etiology of the observed change in behavior. And organic always means medical condition and or the direct physiologic effects of a substance, right? So let's take medical condition first. Uh, first question that I like to pose is whether or not there is discrete evidence in Stephen King's script to suggest or support that Arnie has a general medical condition. Not to my knowledge. It doesn't, doesn't look like it, right? So it, it doesn't look like Christine, the film would be a fictional case study of a behavioral change due to an underlying general medical condition, right? So uh, that's certainly my initial impression, but we do need one more follow-up question, and that is, uh, despite there being discrete evidence, are we really gonna be reassured that Christine isn't about 
a behavioral change due to a general medical condition? I would say we're in the intermediate category. So like we've been discussing, the two risk factors for putting someone, that we, we, the two risk factors that we think their psychiatric illness may be more likely explained by organic etiology are increased age and the male sex. So if he's a young male, so he's neither low risk nor high risk. So I would say we can't be totally reassured, but um, he's not high risk either for having an organic etiology. Exactly right. And, we're, and how that translates into our case formulation is that, yes, we will keep in our differential, but we will leave it low in the differential. That is, it's not likely, but we're, we're not going to dismiss it either. All right? So Christine may be about uh, personality change or some behavioral change that is due to an underlying medical condition in as much as he is a male character and males just tend to be sicker and less healthy when compared to females. So the next question is, organicity, is Christine a fictional case about a substance-induced um, behavioral change? Again, I'm not labeling the behavior just yet. And here, we wanna take the two-stepwise approach again. In the film, does Stephen King give us discrete evidence that Arnie is using substances? I don't think he uses, I don't think there's evidence that he's using, but I would say we can't rule out that he's been exposed to toxins or other kind of psychoactive substances. Um, um, I find it interesting that when he's interacting with Christine or whenever Christine is interacting with him, there's this green aura in the car, so that might be indicative of some toxic substances. Okay, so but I think the way the question was phrased, I think we have to agree the answer is no. Yeah. That is, there's nothing discreet in this script that Stephen King wrote in it, or wrote into the script uh, with the intent of making Christine the film uh, a fictional case of a substance-induced mental disorder. Uh, but your answer picks up on the second part of the question, or the follow-up question, which is, despite no discrete evidence, should the clinician be reassured that Christine, therefore, is not a fictional case of a substance-induced mental disorder. And I'm hearing you say, no, we should not be reassured, because there is some stuff going on in this movie, not the least of which is that uh, anyone can be using substances but not be discreet about it. And that's a wonderful parallel to how patient care is provided. That is, as you're watching this movie, whether it's really or truly your first time watching it, it parallels the first time you meet a patient, that is your, your initial interview. And after you conduct your initial interview, you should never as a clinician definitively rule out a substance-induced disorder because your patient may unreliably tell you that they don't use, when in fact they do. That does happen with addicts and that does happen in addiction medicine. Even when you, you're, the clinician is unaware that they're actually practicing addiction medicine because that has not been disclosed by the patient. All right, so it's a nice parallel here. And, and similarly, we're not gonna be tricked in formulating a false negative. That is, saying that something is not there when in fact it is because the patient hid it from us. All right, so there's a parallel here. So we're gonna keep this in a differential as well. And where it belongs in the differential, high, mid, or low, has everything to do with some evidence suggestive of Arnie hiding this from us. And that's, that's exactly what you were addressing here, right? So maybe Stephen King was giving us a little bit of a hint with regard to, that, to the green hue or light uh, that surrounded Christine, right? That certainly could be metaphorically taken, um, as well as other things that you picked up on as well, right? So uh, that's the way I would case formulate the potential organic etiology of what you recognize as problematic behavior, a change in behavior, all right? So beyond that, let's start to talk about what specific behaviors you are concerned about. And the easiest way here is, again, to start broad and to narrow our scope. Starting broad, choice A, mood anxiety cluster. Choice B would be a psychotic dissociative cluster. Be careful. I'm not asking the question about what, I, what you think is going on here. I'm asking if you were to identify and try to categorize the type of behavior observed, 
what would a reasonable person say, A or B? That's different than saying, what diagnosis do you think they have, and where, A or B, does that diagnosis fit? So don't jump to the end and guess, or try to guess what I'm thinking. I want you to simply identify the behavior as either a mood anxiety cluster or a psychotic dissociative cluster. And if you could actually clone these folks and have 100 undergrads with us, or let's say 99, what would the majority say? Cluster B. Cluster B, that this is a psychotic dissociative cluster. And if that's the case, we've got to talk about schizophrenia. Because arbitrarily, that's where we should always start this conversation, right? I mean, um, uh, schizophrenia is pretty much the gold standard when it comes to the psychotic dissociative cluster. So this, if we had a room full of medical students or undergraduate Rucker students, this is where we would begin to talk about the inclusion criteria for schizophrenia. And I'll just list, it, list them for us now. Schizophrenia is, is a mental disorder. Actually, let me just backtrack briefly. It's a chronic mental disorder. Here, we're gonna operationalize chronicity six months or more. It's a chronic mental disorder in which the person demonstrates clinically significant positive and negative symptoms of psychosis. Positive symptoms are those symptoms that are the pathological presence of something that at baseline should not be there. Examples of positive symptoms of psychosis include hallucinations, delusions, disorganized behavior, or disorganized speech. Those are four common examples of positive symptoms. Therefore, they are four diagnostic criteria for the syndrome labeled schizophrenia. In addition, there is a fifth criterion that simply states negative symptoms. And any negative symptom will allow you to rule in for that diagnostic criteria. Negative symptoms are the pathological absence of something that at baseline should be there. Uh, we often remember them as the five A's. Unfortunately, very infrequently can people actually remember what those five words that begin with the letter A are. So as a mnemonic, if you go by the second initial, it spells out the word plant, All right? So the five A's, any one of which would rule in for negative symptoms of psychosis, and therefore negative symptoms of schizophrenia include apathy, alosia, the third criteria, or the third example, goes by the first initial, the A itself, right? Affective flattening. Anhedonia. And then the final is attention deficit, P-L-A-N-T. We'll get to the actual definitions of those terms later. If your patient rolls in for any one, they rule in for negative symptoms one of the five criteria for schizophrenia, the inclusion criteria. So let's pause for a second, and I wanna hear your thoughts about whether or not Arnie actually at this point is ruling in for schizophrenia. Yeah, I think so. I think so, so obviously if we're putting aside the supernatural dimensions of the film, <laughs> then we would say he has clear auditory and visual hallucinations um, he has clear, I would say he has delusions in the sense that he has paranoid thinking. He thinks that a car is alive and is attacking people. Um, I don't, I think in the sense that his thought is disorganized yet. So I would say that's not present. Um, and then finally for negative symptoms, I don't think they were, I don't think he has clinical significant negative symptoms. I tend to agree. And you only need two of that list. So it looks like Arnie is ruling in. Uh, at this point, the clinician has to be reminded that this condition, schizophrenia, is a diagnosis of exclusion. That is, you can't rule it in until you now investigate and rule out other illnesses, and there are five. Now the good news is that the first two, we've already discussed, right? And that would be the role of substances, as well as an underlying medical condition. So we already discussed those, and we've already placed those with regard to where we believe they belong in the differential. So that's no different. 
with regard to now thinking that this may be a substance-induced psychotic disorder, uh, and, and therefore not schizophrenia, or even a psychotic disorder that's due to an underlying medical condition. So we're going to discuss those. The third condition to consider that would supersede schizophrenia is an autism spectrum disorder. Right? So the question then is, do we think that Arnie has a pre-existing autism spectrum disorder? A, yes, B, no, C, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And the reason why it doesn't matter, and that's absolutely correct, is um, based in the whole reason why we have to consider this condition to begin with, right? We have to consider autism spectrum because it is defined through clinically significant disorganized behavior as well as speech, two of the criteria for schizophrenia. So we wouldn't want somebody to actually have, have been diagnosed with ASD and then miss that and attribute those defining criteria to schizophrenia and therefore erroneously diagnose them, misdiagnose them as having schizophrenia. On the other hand, even if someone had established ASD, Nuanced that delusions, nuanced that hallucinations would not be attributed or attributable to an autism spectrum disorder. Therefore, in, in, in Arnie's case, that is in fact correct. Uh, the behavior that we recognize and the behavior that we observe uh, uh, may be in fact due to schizophrenia and would not be due to even a pre existing autism spectrum disorder. So, really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The final thing to consider here is whether there's a significant mood component to Artie's presentation. Because if your answer is no, the remaining two conditions of the differential diagnosis, that is a primary mood disorder with psychotic features, and a psychotic disorder known as schizoaffective disorder, are both ruled out. If your answer is yes, we've got to discuss both of those conditions in a little bit more depth and detail. So simple answer, yes or no, thumbs up, thumbs down. Is there a mood component to Artie's or Arnie's behavior? We think there is. Okay. So, with regard to the signs and the symptoms that we think, at least now, may be attributable to schizophrenia, if there is a pre-existing mood disorder, and that mood dis within the context of that mood disorder, the psychotic symptoms have actually manifest, then the primary problem is a mood disorder. And we have to consider both bipolar as well as major depression with psychotic features as a more likely diagnosis. So again, the idea is a mood disorder, whether it's a bipolar disorder or whether it's a depressive disorder, might begin in its mildest form. If untreated or misdiagnosed, it may actually evolve to an intermediate form, a moderate form if, again, continue to be ignored by patient or physician, it may continue to evolve into a severe form. And then in, in, in such cases, that severe form may begin to incorporate even psychotic features, like the belief that your car is interacting with you. So the patient history is gonna help kind of delineate this. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Because if we can see through the um, viewing of the prequel to Christine, that the depression or bipolar features began first, and the psychotic features were later in the course, then it looks like the primary problem would be the mood problem. And therefore, we have to change our diagnosis to a primary mood disorder that is severe with psychotic features. And then, then our discussion is going to then include, well, which mood disorder is it? Is it a depressive disorder, or is it a bipolar and related disorder? So we don't have a sequel to, uh, to Christine because there is no such thing. Right? This is where medical students have taken on scholarly projects to actually write movie scripts to help, uh, to help or assist in a teaching of a didactic and creating prequels that would support a given diagnosis of an identified film is something that students have done for research projects. Um, but no such student has actually undertaken Christine or, uh, the, or the prequel to uh, Christine. 
uh, as a scholarly project. So we don't have that answer. So I want to know your thoughts, your gut. Uh, if you could think more like Stephen King and less like a psychiatrist, would you give Arnie that pre-existing condition, specifically a mood disorder? Why or why not? I think it's um, you can you can't really rule it out because I mean the interaction he had with his mom I would say might be indicative of some type of disorder and there a lot of, there was a lot of bullying that was happening as well. Um, I would say yes, but it would just be a guess. Oh, okay. there's no right answer. Yeah. <laughs> Again, unless, unless we want to give Stephen King a call and see him, yeah. <laughs> he actually drafted such a work and what was contained in that work. There's really no right answer. Um, and certainly, if you were to do this, um, your script, so to speak, of the prequel to Christine would look different than if you took the opposite approach, and that is looked at making Christine, the movie, a fictional case account of schizoaffective disorder. Similar to a primary mood disorder that has psychotic features, schizoaffective disorder is also defined as a person who has co-occurring mood and psychotic symptoms, right? So in any slice of time, let's call it a psychiatric evaluation, during that one hour, these two conditions are clinically indistinguishable. What will help differentiate is always the patient history, okay? And that doesn't necessarily mean the patient self-report because if they're sitting in front of you, both with an affective state, a mood state, as well as a psychotic state, they may, they may not be able to reliably tell you what or how this whole thing began months to years ago. So collateral information, parents, teachers, educators, et cetera, police reports, uh, past psychiatric hospitalizations, all have to be sought to, to, put, to, to, you know, to, to look at the different pieces of that pre-existing puzzle. Uh, of course, your movie script would be significantly different for the prequel if in fact you identify this to be a primary psychotic disorder that by definition just, uh, just happened to have co-occurring uh, depressive or manic symptoms. Uh, that is the condition of schizoaffective. A little, a little bit of a clinical pearl. When you are trying to elicit this history from a patient, uh, whether it's during the acute phase or whether it's uh, after you provide the primary or the original or initial psychiatric eval. Um, if you think that there might be a primary mood disorder that explains their current co-occurring mood and psychotic symptoms, the place to look for the mood symptoms existing without psychosis is at the beginning of the episode. Because there is a chance that this whole thing progressed from mild to moderate to severe, to severe slash psychotic symptoms uh, over time. On the other hand, if this were a primary, primary psychotic disorder that is also in the differential for schizophrenia called schizoaffective disorder, schizoaffective disorder is going to look exactly like a primary mood disorder with co-occurring or with uh, psychotic features in any slice of time. The history with regard to the current episode along its entire timeline, will have co-occurring mood and psychotic symptoms. So you're probably not going to get that history where, where early in the course it's milder and therefore without psychosis, and then you can follow it longitudinally. Instead, the entire episode is defined with co-occurring mood and psychotic symptoms. To identify the fact that it's a primary psychotic disorder, there will be a period somewhere in the course of the illness where the psychotic symptoms persisted in the absence of mood symptoms. That's the only way the clinician understands this must be a primary psychotic disorder. And that period must be at least two weeks. It must be at least two weeks. It can't be two hours, okay, not even two days. It's gonna be at least a two week window where you can glean a history of active psychosis absent mood symptoms. Clinician, this must be a primary psychotic disorder. And the label we put on that primary psychotic disorder that is defined through co-occurring mood and psychotic symptoms is called schizoaffective. Okay. So if we think that Arnie does have a significant mood component, we have to add both primary mood disorder with psychotic features 
as well as schizoaffective disorder in our differential. And I tend to agree with you. I, I tend to think that since there is an acute onset of this, change from previous functioning, uh, that the baseline functioning may have itself included signs of depression. And therefore, this is probably a, uh, a primary mood disorder. And that Christine, the movie, may in fact be a fictional case account of a depressive disorder that is severe with psychosis by the time we pick it up. And the bullying and uh, the, the isolation, uh, the interaction with his parents may be supportive of that. I do tend to agree with you. So I have a question. Um, so in, in real life, we know there's a, a large comorbidity of schizophrenia and depression, for example, that are co-occurring. Um, and so, and we also know, right, from kind of neuroscience and, and, and the neurobiology of these things is that in the brain, they're not as clearly distinguished as the DSM, you know, kind of separates them, obviously. So um, in terms of, if, let's say that you have an adolescent who's uh, who suffers from MDD from, from depression, and then also develops new onset schizophrenia. Um, number one, how do you differentiate that with from MDD with psychosis? And number two, clinically, does it matter in regards to how we're going to treat them or how we're going to conceptualize their case? So I think I think the second part of your question is the easiest to address, and that is clinically, it usually doesn't matter. Now, uh, again. Uh, the, the clinical intervention should always be biopsychosocial. And, and I don't mean to dismiss the psychosocial component of treatment planning, uh, because that might alter, right? Individuals with an established or a primary psychotic process are usually going to require psychosocial intervention that is different than an individual with a primary mood or affective process, okay? Um, for instance, group therapies and group programs are more helpful for the individuals with the psychotic process, whereas individual therapy is likely to be more helpful for the person with the primary mood disorder. Right? So I don't want to dismiss that. So there, there might be some distinction there. But from a pharmacologic perspective, not so much. From a pharma pharmacological perspective, an individual with co-occurring mood and psychotic symptoms probably needs both an antidepressant slash mood stabilizer, depending on what the mood disorder is, mm -hmm. as well as an antipsychotic, whether those symptoms are attributable to a primary mood disorder with psychotic features or the primary psychotic disorder called schizoaffective disorder. Uh, pharmacotherapy usually requires both. Okay. Now, when these medications are effective, the clinician should consider retrospectively what might be going on because there should always be the goal to, um, to expose the individual to medication and med medication side effect uh, at the lowest dose that controls the symptoms. And if the clinician determines that this individual, let's say, has a primary mood disorder with psychotic features, uh, that when the psychotic features are now under control, they should be weaned off the antipsychotic because the primary disorder the, let's say, for example, the depressive disorder should be able to be managed with the antidepressant plus the psychosocial interventions alone. And you don't need long-term antipsychotic management the way you would for chronic psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia and schizoaffective. So you have to revisit that once symptoms are under control. Of course, this is with significant psychoed to patient and family that if they see the psychotic symptoms reoccur, obviously they should call 911, their nearest screening center, or the psychiatrist's office immediately, because they, that medication that had been weaned probably needs to be restarted. So that's where we are with Christine. The final step in this process is whether or not, and this is always a hypothetical, although for some people, not so much, those that geek out during these movies, if you took notes during Christine, as if you were actually watching or observing a real psychiatric eval, and all the information from the script and the movie were synonymous to what the patient will tell you during a routine psych eval. And now you've crossed off everything on that paper that we could justify or attribute to all that we just talked about. Would there be anything left on that paper that is not crossed off? Because if your answer is yes, there's something left, we have, we have more to talk about. 
If your answer is no, all the notes you took, all that which you observed is explainable. By everything we just discussed, we're done. That's the case formulation of Stephen King's Christine. So what do you got? How old is he again, uh, Arnie? Is he 17, 18? Um, okay. Well, if he was, let's say, well, I guess if he was over 18, I would consider also, I mean, again, this would be a, a rule out thing, but a schizoid personality disorder, just because he has kind of, he was a bit of a loner before, and then he dealt with these symptoms, so that'd be the only thing left. Yeah, I mean, that, that gets more into really the etiology of what may have um, caused all this, rather than um, a diagnosis that we would need to establish today to treat, right? Because the schizoid personality, the loner, when clinically significant, does predispose to a future psychotic disorder. So, um, not so much with regard to differential diagnosis, but more in terms of the potential ideology of that diagnosis, right? So uh, that's where I think the schizoid may play a role. So I still think we may be done, right? Everybody's shaking their head and nodding their head. That's good, all right. So that really concludes our discussion with regard to Stephen King's Christine. Uh, again.